Uh, another show, we, we mentioned it briefly before, was Paul Whiteman, which he did at yeah. NBC. Now, just tell us again the, the, with the birds, is the, the pigeons. And oh, the birds. well, the, the, the uh, ABC was behind in constructing studios. So was everybody. And incidentally, that was a major problem we had on all shows. There was no rehearsal time. We had to, we had to rent rehearsal halls from the damnedest people, labor unions, uh, marching band societies, wherever they were in New York, we had to book rehearsal halls who would handle an orchestra, uh, dancers, singers, and whatever else we had going. There was no network so that was able, of course, every studio was jam-packed and there weren't enough of them. ABC was the last to construct studios. Uh, NBC converted studios that I'd worked in in radio, 6A, 6B, 8H, and CBS had a couple buildings too where they had things that they used for radio that they converted, and including the Grand Central Station studios. But the uh, ABC constructing the studios constructed in a writing academy, which was fine space on 65th, 66th Street, and the, it was a, a good studio, but they forgot to tell the pigeons that the horses were out. And there, I can't think of how many occasions in rehearsal, at least maybe once in a while when the show was on, when we were invaded by pigeons. <laughs> and it's hard to get them out. <laughs> uh, by the way, you, you reminded me of something, if I may. Uh, we had a summer replacement, speaking of no scenery, where Pat Ashievsky did a summer series replacing We the People for 13 weeks, and it was called First Camera. Mm -hmm. It was a brilliant idea and a terrible show, not because he didn't write well, but because the concept that everybody, everybody's always wanted to do first person. This was a the camera's the camera lead, show, the right. camera's lead. The, you put actors in fixed positions on, with the chalk marks, and the camera's the one that moves as the hero of the show. Right. And I watched that, and I, I was fascinated, but I knew, because if you like something, it means it's terrible. If your personal likes are in, influence your thinking, it means it's a bad show for a mass medium. Right, right, I'm gonna talk about that. But it was an interesting uh, experiment. And the other summer th replacement, that now I recall, now we're on this track, is Meredith Wilson, who as you know is a Iowa-born, writer of music and the music man and other others uh, equally good wanted to do something with Imogene Coca and we did a, a summer show with just Imogene Coca and her company that didn't work she was not a number one banana no she wasn't and we that became evident even with him writing tell me about the Fred Waring show well you got first you start with Fred Waring right. the, the show came to be because BBDNO and Young and Rubicam had the same client, General Electric, and there was big competition there. Wick Kreider was, I think, in charge of the uh, of, of their portion of of uh, GE, and he put on a show which may have been fine. I had never happened to see it called something like uh, County Fair, which was a little bit on the rural side, but it was lively and moving, and. The management of GE was then, they had two Charlie Wilsons in the world. One was Charlie, Engine Charlie, who ran General Motors, and Electric Charlie, who ran General Electric, both Charlie Wilson. He hated it, personally hated the show. I don't know, he thought it dragged the name down probably because it was too rural. And he came to our account people at uh, Young and Rubicam and said, put on a show for me quick. And well, they quickly determined that he was fond of Fred Waring because he had done some, he was on for General Electric some time back. Fred Waring was a band leader. A band leader with a touring show that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. He played the whole country. He was well known and he was a good musician. He, personally, I couldn't say the same for him, but musically I couldn't fault him. Right. So instantly, the, this is where the management stepped in. Bill Gillette, who was a fine director and our creative guy, and I were chosen to drop everything till we got that show on the air. It took two weeks. Fred's first thing I did was tell Fred's people to go to a gym and slim up, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 get some, get some good makeup advice, uh -huh. and then Fred Fred programmed it. When you work with Fred Waring, it's his people. He tells them what to do. He picks the ones getting the best songs. 
but he did. He had a pretty good, uh, pretty good show lined up. We rehearsed them in his studio, his, his rehearsal hall. Fortunately, we had that working for us, and then it went into what is now I think called the Ed Sullivan, where Letterman is on Fifty Second and Broadway show. Uh, and that was, by the way, built for our sh for this show and built very fast. Uh, we worked, uh, the show is on Sunday and we work seven days a week, almost f all full days from early in the morning till late at night on the show. And that was the one where the kid brought in the Westinghouse lamps for the, for the commercial. The commercial guy was chosen, he's called Mr. Prove It. An actor who is representing the skeptics at General Electric questioned all products is, mm -hmm. is what his purpose was. It was one of the best opening shows I've ever seen. Now you know, a show with a band leader, who's with a company of kids he changed uh, from time to time, is not going to go anywhere in the long haul. There's no reason to tune in. Is the point? Mm -hmm. But this was a particularly good show. And afterwards, there was a party, and I. Uh, Electric Charlie came over. He damn near hugged and kissed me. I said, "Who's he? Who is he doing this to?" I'm looking around. It was me and Bill Gillette, because we had we had done a remarkable job in less than two weeks of putting a major show on and to relieve him of a burden in his eyes. Mm -hmm. I don't think the show could have been that bad, but mm -hmm. to him it was. Mm -hmm. Well, from that point on, neither Bill Gillette nor I wanted to be stuck with the show. Fred Waring is a very difficult man. Never rehearsed for us. Mm -hmm. Never knew a word he was going to say. Even even before this first show, he didn't rehearse. Never rehearsed a line that he ever said in the show, and he was the show. Uh huh. You also we didn't even know how long he was going to take. You also had another problem with Fred, didn't you? We had a lot of problems with what Fred. What were some of the other problems you had with Fred? Well, he didn't want us around to start out with. Uh -huh. He wanted to, he wanted to package his own show. Right. That was obvious from the beginning. W weren't there problems with some of the performers on? And Fred had a relationship with. Fred had a Fred had a, was having an affair with one of the lesser talented performers, and he gave her a couple of leads. Yeah. Right. But there was. And he also seduced the wife of a piano team that he had on, which was a classical piano team, and he finally succeeded in separating them. Uh -huh. Husband-wife so, team. So he was having an affair with two women at the same time. Well, the other one it was a dying romance, the one he had with the uh -huh. with the girl singer. So finally, you just you just didn't want to do the show. Anymore. Well, we never wanted to do it really. We were taken out of the things we liked to put this thing on in an emergency. Yeah. So I think that I, I think I told you I believe it was Greg Garrison we brought in from Chicago. To, right. We hired him first uh -huh. to substitute for the both of us, and then Fred uh, hired him, so he became part of the unit. Talk about the Arrow show, and that this was 19, Arrow was 1951? That was early on. Mm -hmm. The Arrow show was packaged by MCA, and incidentally, during this time, one, some of the biggest battles I had was figuring out how much commission that William Morris and MCA got. Mm -hmm. William Morris wanted it on the below the line cost, which mm -hmm. had never been given before, ever. Mm -hmm. And I was fighting with Wally Jordan and Sal Radham almost every day over that. Mm -hmm. And the MCA was smarter. They packaged the show. And uh, uh, the, the, while they were packaging above the line costs, just talent, they somehow later managed to build the studio and put the whole thing together so they got money on it from both ends, which was fine. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. So Dave Levy started with it. And he had Phil Silver's girl singer orchestra, good good comedy writers, and the show was forty five hundred dollars a week. His he had Phil Silver's, and as you say, probably Jack Guilford was on that show. Right. I don't know what I really don't know what happened. It wasn't anything Dave did, or wasn't anything MCA did, but probably the client couldn't stand Phil Silver's, is what I guess. Which was why. I don't know, funny personality. Yeah, but this Claude Peabody's a pretty st well, stiff shirt, right. stiff white shirt. Literally. Yeah. Literally. And uh, so they had to switch the whole thing. Well, MCA's very smart. They don't switch any more than they have to. But I had Jackie Gleason. He wasn't the head comic. Comic was Hank Ladd, who was a writer, and not too, very, not too heavy. And Burt Wheeler, who was a very good comic when he was with Wolseley, had a hard time uh, by himself. And the biggest problem I had with these guys, the same problem I had with Red Skelton a long time ago, and any, any comic 
who has appeared in nightclubs and has in one act that is surefire, but it's dirty. Mm-hmm. They did not understand you were in the living room as a guest of a family, and you do not offend them. First rule of show business. I don't think they ever got over the concept. Of all people, Red Skelton was a very decent guy. He, he didn't understand. He was raised in a trunk. He had no idea what was proper and what wasn't proper. Mm-hmm. Never got through to Gleason at all. He was an arrogant bugger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Bert Wilson only knew the things that worked for him. Mm-hmm. And they would never try to deviate from anything that worked. Because it worked. Right. They heard the laughs. They tried it out and it worked. Right. And uh, it was almost an impasse. I mean, that show didn't last long because there's no way you could control those guys. Was was Silvers a good, uh, was he, well, you didn't have Silvers. No, I didn't have Silvers. That was Dave's. And you also did Hopper and Cassidy? Yeah, now that's, this, this leads me to another interesting point. Mm-hmm. Bill Boyd was playing Hopper and Cassidy. He couldn't ride a horse, hated horses. But this show was pretty, and this was one of the first film shows. It was in the afternoon or in a kid time period over the weekend. Mm-hmm. And the client constantly wanted him to do commercials for post cereals. Mm-hmm. And he absolutely refused. I took him, I took him to dinner with the clients and, and he said, I am playing in the movie, a 19th century cowboy. And these kids believe me. And therefore I will not do a current commercial. He's got a point. He got a point. I didn't argue with him. And they, they understood his point of view then, accepted it. But, but that leads me to children in television. We took, we took information wherever we got it and tried to analyze it. There are three stories about children that were interesting. Mm-hmm. One young kid who was a son, two-year-old son of our, one of our account executives didn't say a word. He refused to talk for whatever reason. No mama, papa, da da, nothing. Until one day they're driving in the, through, through Darien, the kid looks up and he says, Esso. Mm-hmm. Well, what that tells you, of course, is you're, you have a medium that's making a tremendous impression. The kid isn't going to say any other word except Esso. You got something. Scary. The second story was another account executive is, is in his den and the kids are sitting down deciding what to watch for television, kids, kids shows. And this one started, and then one says to the other, let's not watch this, we haven't seen it before. That meant you could give kids over and over again the same thing, and they'd only get better. And the third one, my daughter was four years old, and she was watching, and I said, do you watch Robin Hood? She said, yes. I said, what does it sell? She said, Johnson's Baby Shampoo. And I said, do you use it? She said, no. I said, what do you use? She said, Halo. I said, why do you use Halo? It glorifies my hair. <laughs> but you learn so much from those little anecdotes from children. They tell you, if you sit down and analyze, why did they say that? You realize the power of the medium. Uh-huh. So was her hair glorified? No. <laughs> the same old ratty hair. <laughs> but she thought it was glorified. But, but And going back to Hopalong Cassidy's point, yeah. was kids really, really believed. That he was Hopalong Cassidy. He wasn't Bill Boyd. He was Buffalo Hopalong Bob Cassidy. Smith. Buffalo Bob Smith. Spokesman he was. Over and over again, starting with uh, Ma Perkins and characters like that, you, you really believe. And they're talking to them. They're talking to them out loud when they're alone, don't forget. Right. This is their confessor. This is their friend. This is their one who thinks they're wonderful. It's all in the mind. But once you get them, you're crazy if you want your own name on something. You just take the money. <laughs> now... Uh, Hopal and Cassidy eventually was started as a feature film, but became one of the... Yes, we co- there was a collection of... Uh, right, which they edited well, at least down. 13, it might have been 26. Right, which they edited down for TV, and then right. they refilmed them. Right. And you have said to me before that people told you that television was a great training ground for the people who made these quickie films. Yeah, the, well, t- the fellow who directed We the People for me, Jim Sheldon, for example, right. finally it came to a point where we had to tell people like that there's no more business in New York. We're not going to put on live shows anymore. And we will give you a job in the agency, but you'll be directing commercials because that's all we've got. And most of them didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. They moved to California. And Jim Sheldon told me first job he got was at Ziv. Uh-huh. 
he was given a script and he, and he was told, you got two days to shoot this half hour. The first day, shoot the opening and the closing and get all the middle you can get on the second day. <laughs> Right. And he had he had to shoot weather to hell with weather anything he had to shoot fast, mm -hmm. and discipline was great for him. And that was and that's he learned that from live television. Yeah, well he knew he knew how to work fast in live television. He didn't have two chances, right. but in in film he had so many variables that uh, shooting in a location particularly that it was more difficult. But he got him in. There was no there was no middle ground. He had to get him in in two days. When did the transition, I think you said that the success of Lucy mm -hmm. told you that film was going to work on television. That radio, well, television first, was first you, had to, you had to, you had to find out how 525 line scanning right. was going to match with the synchronization with any film. Right. That was worked out slowly over a period, I believe, two years. First it started with openings and closings, then it expanded, and local stations were beginning to use 16 millimeter shows. By the way, in although 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter was the choice, only New York and Chicago had 35 millimeter projectors. It had to be reduced to 16 millimeter in any other place in the country. So you only had, and not all networks had it either. So we, we had a lot, of, a lot of contradictions. Lucy was good because, first place, we, early we found out you had to have a laugh track. People do not think things are funny if they're sitting alone or with one other person, even the Marx Brothers, even anybody, even Charlie Chaplin. You do not laugh. You need Laugh is a contagious device. And what Lucy did was she um, emerged as the first one. I don't know whether it's Desi or Lucy. I had great respect for Desi after we worked with him for four or five years. 35 millimeter cameras, which they were all accustomed to, three of them in fixed positions. She, Lucy in front of a live audience, which she's great at, doing the show and editing afterward. Brilliant idea. You had the laugh track built in. It was not a laugh track, it was an audience laughing, I realized. Speaking of the laugh track, Johnny Carson was one of the summer replacements we had on one of the general food shows. I don't know which year this was, but Los Angeles was there, so it had to be a full network by that time. And in the first day going out there, well, Jim Aubrey was one of the assistants on this set, and yeah. Bill Brennan, who was a, a very important guy in television. And there's Johnny, and he was pretty good. First anybody had ever heard of him, doing his sketches. But I was watching him, and we had uh, the, the big television laugh blower in the back. And he was always going to the guy and say, more. Give me some more laughs, and the guy would. And afterward, we we uh, took. I guess it must have been. I don't know if it was a kinescope or what it was, but we we had a reproduction anyway. We went back to his house. He's listening. He said, "Look at those laughs! I'm wowing them." <laughs> <laughs> but that was often often a lot of uh, performers. Uh, thought they were pretty funny because they directed their funniness. Supposedly Milton Berle had his own laugh track. I think it was his mother or something. Oh, his mother always was a clack. Yeah. I saw I saw Milton Berle when he was a young man, 16, in the Chicago Vaudeville Theater. His mother was invisible. Oh, really? She pressed his suit, too. <laughs> so, but now Lucy's success as on film showed you that film would work on television. Oh, yes. Well, we were never... that. Uh, if we could have had a big feature film, even if it were run before, we, we couldn't get it on network. No network would accept it, except Over the Rainbow, mm -hmm. The Wizard of Oz, which mm -hmm. played in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Didn't play in prime time in those right. days. When I was cataloging Goldwyn's library, and Jim Aubrey was a good friend of mine, he said, don't talk to me about feature film and network. We're just not going to do it. Really? So the networks didn't want film on QED. They wanted mm -hmm. it to be long. No, because, it, because they felt it was used merchandise. Right. But at some point, Lucy being an example, a film show worked. Oh, by the way, that was Jim wasn't talking about film versus live. Right. He was talking about, about feature films. film made for television right. versus feature films, which had theatrical distribution. But at some point, somebody realized that with film, you could make tons of money on reruns. Yeah. Without having to go through all that expense, right? Right. When was that? We always knew there would be a rerun value, and the question was, how much rerun could you do? 
Bill Orr was one of the first to do 2626, for example. Mm -hmm. Others did 39, thir the best of the 39 became the 13 summer replacement. That evolved. I don't think there was a, there was a date where you can say it happened in 1952 or three or what. It just slowly, when, and when some people saw it worked, they, they began doing it too. I don't know who the leader was. But the transition moved towards film, and then the film, then the transition moved towards California. Well, it had to be. Film. There was no way to film here, the quantity that was necessary. Nor were there the stars. They wouldn't come here. They did, preferred to be, well, they had other jobs. Uh -huh. And then, well, I've got that long story about how poor star started. Right, which I want to get into, but why couldn't you set up a film studio in New York? Well, we're... When I was the president of Filmways, we had one at 110th Street and the East River. Not 110th, 127th Street mm -hmm. and the East River. You had to have an armed guard to get there. Wow. They did film some things there. Right. But there were, there were a, a half-hour series, and it was very difficult in those days to film in New York. And the studio was... Uh, I can't think of many other studios in New York capable of handling this. You couldn't have set up a temporary studio someplace? Well, Proctor Probably. tried to build one. Uh -huh. There was one in Queens that was used by the Army, which is still being used by people. It is historious. And studio. High Brown had one in Chelsea area. Right. But these, these weren't uh, capable of handling that kind of thing. Uh -huh. You also, you didn't have the actors and actresses, I assume, right? You got 10,000 actors in New York, and every language, you got enough actors here. Right, right. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was technical. Mm -hmm. Now, w one of the conveniences of working in New York was the fact that it was easy to get to places. The subway. Right. <laughs> Number one, the subway. Right. So you could you had to supervise a lot of shows, so it was easy to get around. Oh, yeah. Well, I walked most of the time. Uh -huh. Walk, walking in New York beats anything. But that was a big part of your life. Oh, the yes. The convenience of going from Well, let me tell York. you about my life uh, for... The first five years of television, I got an apartment in Murray Hill, five-minute walk to the office. I was in the office every morning at 8 o'clock interviewing people because I needed help. Ev, Ev picked a lot. Pat picked a lot before that, but you needed people. You needed experienced people. 9 o'clock, I'd get involved in all the agency activity, new business, all the stuff you have to do in the agency, whatever, plans board or anything that gets involved there. Then I'd sneak out about 10 o'clock to go to a rehearsal studio where something was rehearsing. Just wanted to be sure there were no big problems, no, no temperamental problems. I'd have lunch usually with somebody like the network rep. You had to keep in track with your network salesman, he'd get, and he got a lot of gossip from him, or one of the talent guys. And then we'd short lunch. Then I'd it would go into more, going to more studio, more rehearsal studios, because several shows were rehearsing at the same time. Then, uh, I, at the end of the day, I would have 20 calls to return, and I found if you return them all at 6 o'clock at night, most people would, for, they weren't there, but they would forget what they were t calling you for, and you, at least you tried. Mm -hmm. You got big credit for that. And I never did not return a telephone call, even though I knew it was a pest, or it didn't have any, he was trying to sell me 3D, and it was 1.5D. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of those in those days. <laughs> and then the nighttime shows would start. Well, the shows were never on at 7 o'clock. They were always on 8, 9, 10. When you finished, you knew there were a lot of things rotten about the show, so you got to keep people, and you went to a saloon somewhere close by. Usually, It didn't matter what kind of a saloon it was. You just went there. You talked till midnight, got to bed, got up in the morning, <laughs> and went to work again. Same day. Well, of course, Fred Waring's show took all day Saturday, all day Sunday. There, and it was the most glorious time of my life. I could hardly wait to get to the office. And so you saw your kids what? Once every three months? Kids? Years? What kids? <laughs> <laughs> this was the life. I had a house in Connecticut. I never got there. Huh. And um, if you if the shows were going to move to California, there's a huge difference. Because yes. You, got a car, you need a car to start out with. That's <laughs> just to audition, you need a car. Right. And just to go from studio to studio, I mean, it'd take you half the day anyway. Well, when I got when I started going out there regularly, always stayed at the Bel Air with my clients. Mm -hmm. Ed Ebel, in general, was advertising director of General Foods. I went out a lot with him. We would go out in the spring and talk to the key people, talk to MCA, William Morris, Screen Gems, 
and some smaller ones that were working. Oh, always Desi, by the way. Oh, and Desi always had good ideas. Mm -hmm. And we'd sit by the pool because the, you would be awakened in the morning at 7 o'clock because on Eastern time, that's when they had urgent problems for you to handle from New York to L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew it was safe after lunch that they would not be calling. Mm -hmm. That's the only time we could relax from the Eastern calls. Mm -hmm. But then you got involved with the Western with the rehearsals and the talking and everything else, and that went on till midnight. But you'd still be awakened first thing in the morning with a call from the East. So it was not a picnic, but it was great to have a change of uh, scenery. Now, what were the first film shows that you worked on? The first, the ones that made the transition from radio to Well, Lucy, of course. What about, was the Goldbergs one of them? Oh, you mean early days. Right. Aldrich Family and the Goldbergs. Did they work on television? No. Why not? Well, as, as I think I said earlier, uh, Henry Aldrich was not a rational show. Mm -hmm. We could not face the full light of the camera. Everything looked phony. Why not get it? Gertrude get Berg, it? though, I'm surprised I, that that didn't work. She was a, Gertrude Berg was a wonderful person and always came through. The mm -hmm. camera picked up her, right away her personality, warm, friendly, everything else. But it was very New York-oriented. Mm -hmm. I think it possibly it would not be understood across this, the country on television. I mean, leaning out of the tenement saying you who and somebody answering. Right. Uh, it, it's hard to conceive that if you're raised in the Middle West. New York Jewish oriented. But not necessarily. She, was, she transcended anything like mm -hmm. that, in my opinion. She was mm -hmm. just a warm person, didn't matter what she was. Well, what, with Aldrich, why not just get a younger Henry Aldrich? It wasn't just that. The whole show was old-fashioned, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I Married Joan? Well, I Married Joan was done in California. Mm -hmm. And that was all. <laughs> One great line Joan Davis uh, yeah, gave to my vocabulary and anecdotal ability was when she was on the set. And if you know, there was a locked John for the Yahtzee people, stagehands. Mm-hmm. And she had to go to the John very desperately. She walked over and the door's locked. She turned around and she said, who'd want to steal shit? <laughs> <laughs> she was a funny lady. She was a little, little common, a little coarse. For General Electric was her class. Uh -huh. But she was all right. How, how is working on a film show different from working on a live show? Uh, what were the big differences? Well, first place, it's, it's more controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing more boring than going to a rehearsal of a film show, mm -hmm. or a feature film for that matter, because mm -hmm. nothing happens. You get a minute and a half in a, in a feature film, you're doing great right. a day. And we, we, we did shoot the film shows for a three-day schedule, right. six four-hour shows. But it was definitely a more leisurely pace than a Oh, yeah. Show. What would you do? You'd just get in the way. Was it more boring for you? We were not so much boring as that you, you felt ineffectual. Mm -hmm. The work was done long before they got to the, the set. And the technicians were so good that there was nothing you could contribute there. Mm 